Now moving towards the last session of today's e course, that is a panel discussion. I am delighted to invite our moderators for the panel discussion. Very first, I would like to invite Dr. Lokesh Kumar Saini, Associate Assistant Professor, Pulmonary Medicine, Ames Rishike. Sir has done his MBBS from SP Medical College, Bikaner. Sir has many publications to his credit and presented many papers in various national and international conferences. He is an active reviewer of multiple national and international journals. Presently, sir is conducting multiple funded intramural and extramural projects. I welcome you, sir. Thank you. For our panel discussion, our next moderator is Ms. Kisha N. Shakaria, Vice Chair of Indian Academy of Respiratory Care. Madam is a respiratory therapist specialized in neonatal and pediatric respiratory care, graduated from Manipal Academy of Higher Education. Madam has served as a faculty at Mahe for since last six years. Currently, she is the director of respiratory care at Kannad Hospital Al Align, UAE, and also the vice chair of the Indian Academy of Respiratory Care. I welcome you both. The theme for the panel discussion is multidisciplinary respiratory care in COVID-19. I request you to, to kindly proceed with the session. Thank you. Okay. So let us start the discussion with the introduction of our panelist. Um, in this panelist, uh, um, we have two panelists from our institute, my institute only, from AMC Chikesh. Um, if Madam is there, yes. So one is Dr. Vasanta Kalyani, madam. She is a PhD, MSc Nursing, MSc Psychology. She is currently the Principal and Associate Professor in Department uh, in the College of Nursing in Shikesh. Madam has more than 22 years of experience in nursing education, service and research. Chapters in nursing books. Madam is editorial and reviewer of uh, various national and international journals and she is also executive board member of various universities. So I welcome you, madam, in this panel. Um, ma'am, please unmute yourself. Please, we cannot hear you right now. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Next. Thank you. Next, we have uh, Ms. Surbi Tabliyal with us. She is master's, master's in physiotherapy in cardiopulmonary and ICU. Uh, she is working as a physiotherapist in Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation in Sri she, she, uh, she, she has done her master's of physiotherapy from Swami Rama Himalaya University, Dehradun, Uttarakhand. And uh, she has spoken in multiple, uh, regarding multiple, uh, uh, role of rehabilitation in COVID-19 patients in different state universities. So I welcome Surabhi also. Surabhi, are you there? Yeah, we are here. Okay, so uh, for next introduction, I'll like to invite Ms. Tisha to introduce our the rest of the panelists. Uh, thank you, Dr. Lokesh. Um, first of all, it's a privilege and honor to be part of this panel discussion today, which is uh, uh, collaborated by AIMS Education IARC, uh, a great achievement for IARC indeed. So we have three more panelists and uh, I would like to introduce uh, our first of the next three is Dr. Vivek Kumar. He is a graduate and postgraduate from Armed Force of Medical College, Pune, and he has specialized in internal medicine. He has completed his DNP in um, internal medicine from National Board of Examination. He, is certi he has certifications of IFCCM, uh, EDEC, EDEC, and he has his research public specializations are uh, in intensive care echocardiography, long-term mechanical ventilation, COVID-19 infections, and he has more than 20 indexed publications in national and international publications. He is a fellow of Indian College of Physicians, American College of Physicians, and Indian College of Critical Care Medicine. Currently, Dr. Vivek is working as additional director of critical care and emergency medicine at Sir HN Reliance Foundation Hospital and Research Center, and is the clinical lead for a 650-bedded 
COVID Jumbo Facility at NSCI Worley. Welcome you, sir. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Our next uh, panelist is uh, Mr. Dan Rowley. Uh, most, uh, most of them call him Dan. And he is um, a postgraduate. He has done his RIT in ACCS and NPS. And he is a fellow of ARC. He is an um, adult clinical coordinator in respiratory therapy. And he has 28 years of practicing respiratory care to his credit. He is currently the president of International Council of uh, for Respiratory Care. He has being the chair of Virginia Residential Board of Respiratory Care and currently holds uh, advisory and committee positions on national and international committees related to respiratory care. He has multiple publications to his credit and uh, he's a known face to conferences around the globe. Welcome, Dan. Are you there with us? Yes, I am. Thank you very much. Uh, you're welcome. <laughs> yeah. So our next panelist is uh, Mr. Akash Soni. He is a graduate and postgraduate in respiratory therapy, and he has done it from St. Bias International University, Pune. He has several years of experience in respiratory care, and he serves as a senior RT at Raheja Hospital, Mumbai, which is commissioned, which was commissioned as a critical uh, COVID critical center when the pandemic start, uh, started off. And uh, he's also associated with Symbiosis University Pune as an adjunct faculty of the Respiratory Therapy Program. He also holds position of General Secretary of the Maharashtra chapter of IERC. Akash, welcome. Are you there? You have to unmute yourself, Akash, He's there? Yeah, yeah, yeah I'm here. <laughs> okay, that's great. Yeah, thanks okay. for the introduction. Welcome. So uh, we have uh, five people with us and our topic for today is multidisciplinary respiratory care in COVID-19. As we had a very good inaugural ceremony and the talks, which just reinforces that, you know, we need to be multifactorial, we need to be multidisciplinary and we need to reinforce our team to kind of uh, Cater to the needs that is demanding nowadays, and it is we don't we have no and we don't have know where the road is leading to us. So um, I would like to start this discussion with Dr. Vivek. Okay, so uh, we have seen COVID patients present to us so differently, and they present at different phases of the disease progression, and um, also with different phenotypes, and they different again differently, uh, present again differently to us. What has been your approach and strategies to a patient with respiratory distress at the ER? Uh, can you just repeat the last line, please? What has been your approach? In, uh, of, of, a pa of a patient with respiratory distress that presents at the ER. Okay. So I think the most important time is the, um, the most important point in history is the timeline. So it is how many days from symptom onset. So if you are in the first week of symptom onset, well, probably it's a rapid disease progression. And we are looking at a, something like a primary viral pneumonia, which is extensive and bilober. If it is in the second week of illness, well, uh, from the symptom onset, we are looking at something like a cytokine storm. If it is in the third week of illness, and well, then we are probably looking at more closely at a picture of underlying lung fibrosis. Now, between the three weeks, the things are not crystal clear, like, you know, day of first week, second week, third week. But typically, anywhere in the three weeks, they can come in with venous thromboembolism. And anywhere in the three weeks, they can come in with the acute coronary syndrome, typically a acute myocardial infarction. Now, when we look at the patient phenotype, you know, so if I have a clean patient, a young person with no comorbidities, and on the other extreme, I have an elderly or I have a person with multiple comorbidities. So obviously the people with comorbidities have less of a cardiopulmonary or any physiological reserve in the body and they pack up pretty early. So people with comorbidities may precipitate with breathlessness in the very first week and may not be having such extensive disease. So when we look at breathlessness in the first day, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, you know, then if we try to we image the patient and once we image the patient, we do confirm that it is a primary viral pneumonia. It is unlikely to be anything else. We do send in the inflammatory markers. 
most of the time inflammatory markers are not raised in the first five days yes day five to day seven they may be borderline high in the second week also when the patient comes in with respiratory distress we troubleshoot we do the imaging the imaging can be a x-ray chest a bedside lung ultrasound or a ct scan if required we send in the inflammatory markers typically they are raised and the patients are in a cytokine storm but then you know it's a heterogeneous disease there are patients, I say, with bad x-rays and low oxygenation. And then there are patients with good x-rays and low oxygenation. So if you have a patient phenotype with good x-rays and low oxygenation and the inflammatory markers are not raised, well, typically this subset may be a vasculopathy or what we know as an endotheliitis. In these patients, we quickly send in the D-dimers along with the inflammatory markers. We do the lung ultrasound and we do the DVT screening. Uh, most of the times... You know, the disease is not there in the lungs and the DVT screen is negative and even the D-dimers are not raised, but they are profoundly hypoxemic. If possible and if facilities exist, we send them for a CT pulmonary angio. And if not, and then we come to a clinical differential, well, it is a vascular disease related progression, something like a, you know, diffuse pulmonary microangiopathy for which beyond this, we cannot do any other workup. Moving from the second week to third week, one differential, of course, is that there is disease progression and there is fibrosis. And for this, again, at the bedside, we make it out by doing lung ultrasounds. And also, if the patient is intubated and ventilated, we come to know the lung mechanics, especially if the compliance is extremely reduced and the pressures are very high. So we know he's heading for stiff lungs. But the other differential which comes in in the third week and definitely in the fourth week is, is it a secondary bacterial or a fungal super infection? and then we do target that. So this is how we look at and our therapeutics are very clear. In the first week, they go in for antivirals. After day four, they go in for steroids, prophylactic dose of anticoagulation. In the second week, of course, now early, early, if there is a vasculopathy, of course, in this forum, uh, we are definitely using a drug called uh, bevacizumab, which is not approved, but which has got extremely good results when patients are uh, uh, going from zero to four liters or four to 15 liters very fast. It acts on the vascular endothelial growth factor and patients do come down on their oxygen uh, support extremely rapidly from 15 liters to 2 liters over the course of next 48 hours. Probably we'll be publishing it as a retrospective analysis, but the drug is safe. As a clinician, I cannot endorse it, but it just goes on to prove that there is a, a component of a vasculopathy. If we are in the cytokine storm and the patient has received 48 hours of therapeutic steroids, we try to blunt the cytokine storm. Uh, we use doses of tocilizumab, but unfortunately of late, it has not been available. We've used an alternative called etolizumab, but then uh, there have been, the patient tolerance is not so good. And definitely we find that these patients are more vulnerable to secondary sepsis. If the lungs are getting fibrosed, well, there is nothing we can do. We do continue the steroids at a lower doses. We have not come to a consensus, but the evidence is against the use of uh, perfenidone or any of these agents as such. And we do not have a trial in which we are enrolled for this. For super infections, we have kept our antibiotic policy very simple. If we have patients who are clean at admission and they are going on to steroids, we may probably, and they have a moderate disease to severe disease, we start them with the augmentin. But if we are escalating on the steroids and going on to immunosuppressives, we take them on to piperacillin tazobactam. However, if a patient comes from co uh, community who's got comorbidities and who's got pre-existing organ failures, who's had recent admissions where we suspect that there are community acquired MDR bugs or MDR bugs, which the patient is colonized with, we do start with the piperacillin tazobactam when they are in the moderate phase of the illness. And if, they, if there is disease progression and if there's evidence of further infection or a super infection, then we step it on to probably, I will say, a non-carbapenem based regimen because we found a lot of carbapenem resistance and infection control has been a huge problem. So this is how I approach. My weapons are very clear. The protocol, any respiratory distress, look at the SPO to properly see that the probe is properly placed, see that you are getting a good plethysmographic waveform, see that there is a blood pressure, go in with the ABG, do the SpO2 FiO2 ratio, take the RR, calculate the ROCS index because we also love to teach. And of course, quickly rush in with the lung ultrasound, see whether the, the lung, the B lines are sliding. There is sliding of the pleural line on both the sides. That is good. If you have 
thick pleural lines and if you have shaggy pleural lines you have broken pleural lines probably it's advanced disease and this patient will definitely head for some form of ventilatory support if you have a lot of b lines well there may be some fluid but in all probability if you have a lot of b lines with thick and broken pleural lines and c patterns on lung ultrasound this patient has got advanced disease quickly do a echo and rule out ra rv dilatation and a proximal dvt screen to rule out venous thromboembolism now in the second and then follow it up with the x-ray chest and if facilities permit a CT scan. The last thing I want to say is we've done a study also and there is an incidence of spontaneous pneumothorax. We've had it once on NRBM 15 liters per minute. We do see it on NIV. We've seen not seen it on HFNC so far and on invasive ventilation. Well, I would just like to say PEEP doesn't help in all patients. Be very clear in the first week you can recruit the lungs maybe. In the second week, pray and then do the recruit recruitment maneuver in the third week never recruit and if you are having a super infection i think it go by the lung mechanics i mean i will prefer not to recruit the lungs so i will say just individualize the peep high peep doesn't help at all thank you that's a great insight sir uh, and a very holistic one um, thank you so much for your inputs uh, i would like to move more as you said it, you know it differs non repeating mask high flow and niv you should have to be very selective in what phase you're going to choose it for the patient uh, dan i would like to bring in you in this uh, in, at this moment for getting your experience on introduction of HFNC or non repeater mask. What do you, what, what is your practice being like and what is your experience during this pandemic from the uh, ER? From the emergency room, excellent. Uh, yes. First of all, thanks for uh, inviting me to uh, be among this excellent panel of experts uh, speaking on your uh, symposium today. Um, I do work in the emergency room frequently, and during wave one, where we didn't know a whole lot about COVID, um, of course, uh, we were uh, um, trying to avoid uh, non-invasive ventilation and high-flow nasal cannula, as many of the presenters had pointed out. Now that we're in wave three and we're starting to see um, uh, an increasing number of non-vaccinated patients come into the emergency room, uh, we are once again uh, becoming busy in my emergency department. So my experience is, is that when a patient comes into the emergency department, I'm getting on my PPE immediately. We're limiting the number of people who are in these um, airborne infection isolation rooms because we're likely going to be performing some type of aerosol generating procedure. Uh, when I walk into that situation, we have patients presenting with profound hypoxemia. So my immediate goal, of course, is supplemental oxygen. Um, oftentimes they're uh, at this point on a non-rebreather until I can get them over to a high flow nasal cannula or non-invasive ventilation if they don't need to be intubated. During my assessment, of course, uh, one of the things that I like to do is um, assess their work of breathing. Of course, patients can uh, remain tachypneic, but as long as they don't have high workload, meaning accessory muscle flexion, they can actually uh, be managed for extended periods of time um, with these non-invasive uh, approaches. And then last but not least, um, I immediately now um, encourage self-proning. Once we get the patient on a monitor and they remain hypoxic, self-proning is a very big early intervention for us. Okay, that's great. So it's prone with HFNC and if the time is delayed, you use a non the mask during that time period. Have you had any experience of pneumo uh, like uh, Dr. Vivek was just mentioning? Any cases like that? Yeah, not necessarily in the emergency department, but of course we've seen uh, growing accounts uh, of pneumomedia synums among our patients. And it's not because we're not providing lung protective ventilation. I think that um, one thing that we have to consider, regardless if they're a PEEP responder or non-PEEP responder based on the ideology of what we're dealing with, um, I, we have to consider is the patient have a high inspiratory load, okay? Are they spontaneously breathing? Because a lot of these pneumomedia stinums are likely a result of very high inspiratory transpulmonary pressures that are occurring as patients work or breathing is high uh, during these uh, acute phases or even in a fibroproliferative phase in late, uh, late stage or recovering uh, COVID, uh, we're seeing this. And it's because as we're lighting sedation, their workload's high. Okay, fine. I would like to also bring in uh, Akash at this point to share, share his thought, his experience in Trehaja, which has been a COVID uh, critical care center. 
Uh, what have been your experiences in the ER and how do you kind of scale up uh, respiratory care management from the ER to the ICU for the COVID-19? So uh, uh, as in the ER, uh, the, uh, uh, in the ER, we mostly receive the patients on a bit with the specific hypoxemia and we will start with the we start the NRBM and we eventually don't start a HFNC there because we have a limited facility and the limited uh, um, the machine stock. So, so first we try to manage the patient on NRBM there. Okay, and then we uh, uh, and then the patient stabilizes. We, we try to shift the patient to the intensive care unit, and then and then we take the further actions there in the intensive care unit. Uh, there we start uh, uh, where we first assess the patients. We, we see the patient's hemodynamic stability. Uh, we assess for respiratory distress, and accordingly take a call um, for which devices uh, will be appropriate to use for the patient, whether high flow or whether NIV. And and of course, prior to that, we would, we would also do a blood gas to see the patient's level of hypoxemia uh, and hypercapnia if there is any. And uh, accordingly, we will choose the device. Uh, moreover, if we are if we, if we are uh, if we are keeping the patient off uh, on a on a on a non breathing mask, we, we would uh, we would like to choose or prefer prefer choosing high flow nasal oxygen. With, uh, with the starting of, uh, uh, um, uh, I mean, with, with the starting of the, um, at least, with the starting with moderate flow, fifty liters of the flow, and with the with the with the initial in, um, FiO two hundred percent, and then uh, and, and then gradually titrating the FiO two levels um, to uh, to achieve our oxygenation, and then we, we, we would take the call in, in case of the patient tolerates well, the patient is patient is patient is on uh, patient is on out mouth breather. The patient breathes well and tolerates well through the uh, through nasal cannula. Also, we prone the patients on a on a high flow nasal cannula. We uh, we we counsel them, encourage them so that uh, it helps them to improve their oxygenation levels. Okay, that's great. Uh, so we we be around the globe prone with HFNC seems to be a kind of an answer for us for some bit of the days, right? So I would uh, now want to bring in the Vasanta Madam, uh, who, um, uh, since our topic is multidisciplinary respiratory care, and there's a huge onus on the nursing care that uh, has to be catering to multiple roles. And I'm sure there's no RT um, in most of the facilities. And uh, the nursing and the PT uh, department kind of caters to all the needs. Uh, Vasanta Madam, could you just enlighten us how, what kind of, what, what is the current practice at your uh, facility and how this is being managed or kind of uh, fulfilled by the nursing and the PT from the ER onwards uh, to your host in your hospital? Yes. Um, thank you. Uh, yes, you are right. When there is an absence of uh, RTs, nurses and physiotherapists only taking care of the patients. That is a uh, nurse's role if you feel uh, they have been designated as oxygen nurses. Oxygen nurses, they will be ensuring the assessment onwards in the prescription. They will be with that particular two things. They have to ensure the assessment. Assessment part, they have to ensure about the saturation and then the patient's respiratory rate and then use of other accessory muscles and then the flaring. These are all the things first they have to assess it, their respiratory, um, blood pressure, the assessment part, as well as the combination of the assessment part and the prescription of the doctors for oxygen. They have to confirm with this, with the proper PPE, appropriate PPE, they have to ensure which type of oxygen has been advised. Either it is a, according to the saturation, the prescription can be a litters and then which kind of device they have to ensure it and then after ensuring they have to make the ensure that they are fitting the instruments the method of maybe the canalization or mask or a hfnc they have to you that is use it in a appropriate technique and then ensure it it is that is gaining the saturation within 15 minutes every 15 minutes in the initial period of one to two hours, if they are in ER, they have to check every 15 hours if there is a rise in saturation. If at all, every 15 minutes, if they are not getting any benefit, at the saturation level, according to the condition of COVID, either it is mild or moderate, and then the severe means immediately they will take into the critical care areas. So according to the condition of the COVID, the uh, degree of the COVID 
or lung infection they have to understand what is the higher level of respiration that is what is our goal in aiming the saturation either it will be less than 95 or it's going to be more than that so this ensurement every 15 minutes if they are checking about the saturation and then the respiratory rate and then properly that is recording and documenting and then giving the report to the treating physician and then going with a further other managements so with that if it is hfnc they have to check for humidification and then their uh, assessment what whether the device is available or which is the bed availability where to shift the patient without any crisis so they have to uh, check these things meanwhile their nurses role will be very much important the multi system coordination then which are all the physiotherapists to come if it is needed of uh, lung toileting if it is icu or otherwise the simple physiotherapy which is the way they have to coordinate with physician physiotherapist and the other uh, members of shifting especially with the family members also which type of oxygenation has been initiated and then how the progress is going and then remaining concern and other things which the physician has been explained to the family members and then they have to ensure it for the further improvement or further recordings or further informations if you are giving to the patients so these are all and at the same time the critical care patients they can go for the critical situations also so the non invasive ventilation or invasive technique endotracheal tube the setting of the materials which is necessary may be further needed maybe they have to get ready uh, check for the functioning of the instrument and then align all the materials which is which may be required further in the process so these things with periodically every shift or every 2 hours because of covid every 2 hours our nurses has been done this actually so they have to check periodically all the things and then they have to get it arranged and then inform or the particular critical care nurse also so once a patient has come with the hfnc and then now the saturation is like this may be required the critical care bed so with the hospital administration so it's like uh, they have to do the multiple uh, role uh, to care the patient from er to till to the ward means oxygen to be ready the connectors and then the humidification to be ready if it is icu which type of niv or et which to be everything they have to make it sort of ready along with a family information also so this is uh, what the nurses role with a multidisciplinary team approach and then they have to care the patient with informing either if the patient is conscious informing the information to the patient as well as to the uh, family members i feel this is what their from the assessment they have to keep updating the information to all the team members and then do their preparation also that is okay. i feel the nurses has to be yes ma'am i agree with you that there's a lot of uh, multi uh, multiple tasks that has been uh, yes. on a yes. jack of all trades i would say uh, that has been happening uh, with this pandemic uh, with our nursing community right uh, dr lokesh you want to add on any uh, kind of uh, any more comments on this particular uh, area or thread of thought see um, as madam said already in, in our emergency room uh, after this pandemic our emergency is always flooded with the patient then our then the capacity of emergency so what we used to do is definitely we we all are in our uh, pv only all of nursing officers and all our you know supporting staff including uh, and doctors also so we all are in, in our pp only what we do is we uh, do our initial assessment and initial stabilization of patient and we will see if the bed is there in the you know as per the requirement of the patient in the, uh, either in the icu or icu we will just shift him there because emergency is always you know very busy place in our hospital so um, this is what we all do okay so so uh, let me take the lead now and um, vivek sir i'll ask you um, 
my question when we shift the patient from emergency to either hdu or icu so um ma- many times it is being asked to as from our, our residents also that sir what should be the ideal time of you know stopping hfnc to shifting to an iv or stopping an iv and shifting to um mechanical ventilation by ventilator and one more thing i want to add here i want to ask actually sir um one more scenario would be what uh, i hope uh, i'm sure you have also faced this thing that even after intubation of the patient with maximum ventilatory support and prone ventilation sometimes the patient became refractory to you know our our, our treatment and they they remain hypoxic so what is your advice regarding either ventilatory mode settings or maybe um, you know use of um, any anything else any inhaled medication to improve hypoxemia in these patients so my question is in two parts sir regarding that so i'll take it in two parts i yes. think in the first part there is only one thing in covid don't look at anything look at the respiratory rate as daniel said it's just the work of breathing even if the spo2 is 80% the patient is happy and he looks comfortable and the work of breathing so if the patient is not in distress if the patient is able to answer your questions he is not sweating he is not using accessory muscles there is no paradoxical breathing there is no indrawing of the intercostal muscles and he is comfortable except the hypoxemia unless you know it's by god low so if the patient is comfortable do not escalate uh, from whatever so if you are on say uh, nrbm and if you are moving from 6 you can move to 8 liters 10 liters 15 liters if you are targeting the spo2 but a decision to move Uh, to a level of ventilatory support so if the patient is comfortable so it's very simple speak a few lines to him ask him a few questions see whether so one is he is comfortable at rest second is he should be comfortable in communicating with the uh, treating team when they come for rounds third is that he should be comfortable with at least the passive movements which our physiotherapy team offers so if he is in comfortable with all these three things leave him as it is if you want the spo2 to look better you can go up on the number of liters of oxygen per minute but if he is having a respiratory distress and then you know you can just interpret it if it's a inspiratory distress or a expiratory distress and see what is his uh, do a gas see whether the, it is a hypoxemia or it is a rising co2 if he is in distress well definitely you move to the next level of support from nrbm you can go to hfnc if it is available and allowed because many of these patients are profoundly anxious and most of them become claustrophobic the moment you apply an iv give a trial of hfnc if hfnc is not working give them a trial of niv and give them a trial of niv and if you can also do a awake prone or niv so if the work of breathing is not increased that means the patient's respiratory rate is not very high and he is comfortable he can breathe in and breathe out comfortably speak a few sentences do a few gestures uh, tolerate some sessions of physiotherapy leave him otherwise you escalate and you intubate so more than spo2 more than co2 it is the work of breathing otherwise they become prone to self induced lung injury and despite the spo2 looking good so if a patient has got a spo2 of 95 and if he is on a, a fio2 of 80% but he is breathing at around 40 there is no point and rather he is worse than a patient whose spo2 is 86 but who's breathing comfortably at 20 and who looks that he is up and about himself so i think that's a that's a clinical assessment and the one thing is work of breathing now in answer to your second question intubate them prone them early now after proning if you have any further requirements the only way you can meet them is basically uh, one is that you individualize the ventilatory strategies so that means try to get an idea of the lung so if once we have intubated sedated paralyzed try to get a idea of the lung mechanics there are many patients whom after intubation we find that even with x rays which look white 
too much white but once you intubate sedate and paralyze you will find that the lung compliance is not so bad and they are getting ventilated very easily so probably all they have is some fluid and it they don't have a fixed problem they have some fluid and drying them up that is giving them diuretics or keeping them in a negative balance will help them out these are the patients who you can just go up gently on the peep and mostly they will respond to a increase in peep a couple of patients we have done recruitment maneuvers but before that we have done our prayers and especially early in the disease but they have tolerated them well but so i will say is first intubate sedate paralyze please do the inspiratory hold please do the uh, inspiratory hold get an idea of the static lung compliance see the pressure volume loop so you will know how bad the lungs are now if the lungs are compliant you will get benefit by increasing the peep and drying up by using diuretics now if the lungs are non compliant then there is no point in increasing the peep and too much of diuresis also is not going to help it can be counterproductive now once we check the lung lung mechanics the second strategy is go in for early proning but the your question was which mode well i always now that we bought a lot of ventilators in the pandemic in a short time so every day the doctor will come so this does not have prvc this does not have this. so i tell them only one thing ventilator is like a microwave oven when they came in early when the microwaves when we used to buy them from dubai and bring them they had options like fried rice grilled fish cooked chicken and mutton but then if you read the manuals it said low heating for a longer time high heating for a shorter time so you know you need to understand and i just tell them get the lung physiology and match the mode to the physiology so in this case and especially seeing the pneumothorax i always prefer to sedate paralyze and start start with a volume control mode we try that we match the 6 ml per kg of a ideal body weight even if the lungs are not stiff because it has been shown that even if the lungs are not stiff and you are using lung protective ventilation it is better it in, in reduces the chances of ventilator induced lung injury now with this strategy there will definitely be some gain in oxygenation but you may end up retaining some carbon dioxide if you are retaining carbon dioxide accept it till the time the ph is less than 7.2 so till that time as long as the gases are getting compensated the kidney function is good there is and you can continue with this strategy uh the uh, i mean so i would definitely like to start with a volume control mode and most of these patients are long haulers none of them gets uh, extubated in the first week itself so all of them need so it's a volume control mode lung protective ventilation 6 ml per kg of ideal body weight peep which is Uh, titrated to the lung mechanics soft and compliant lungs you can go up to 8 cm i don't advocate any peep beyond that and if there are stiff lungs and if you have high ventilating pressures and you are not even able to dial get the accepted tidal volumes keep the peep at around 6 because most of these patients when we uh, reduce the peep also or when we increase the peep there's no gain in oxygenation when we reduce it there's hardly any drop in oxygenation so these are not peep responders so there's no point just increasing peep you can keep a peep of about 5 cm of water and leave it like that so this is how i set the tidal volume and then i set the peep we set the respiratory rate to carbon dioxide clearance so that we try to get a psco2 of around 40 and uh, we also see that if whatever respiratory rate we keep and the patient is adequately sedated and paralyzed they don't auto peep so you have to be very careful because many a times to wash out carbon dioxide you go in on respiratory rates of 35 and above but the patient should not auto peep so you can do a expiratory hold which is good because it uh, gives good practice and then ensure so that is how i said fio2 well yes we go on to fio2 at least to keep the pao2 of around at least 60 62 minimum you know so at least whatever minimum fio2 but typically when we intubate these patients most of them need a fio2 of 80 or 90% they need a peep of between 6 to 8 they need tidal volumes around 350 and respiratory rate of around 30 now this is a good starting point then individualize the ventilatory strategies as per lung mechanics 
prone them very early and once you are proning definitely there will be a gain in oxygenation and most of the times there is a reduction in carbon dioxide so you can come down on the tidal volumes a little but if you are on peep of 8 you can definitely bring it to a peep of 6 and so and dry them up a little so it is individualized mechanical ventilation. No mode is superior to other mode. It is your understanding of the ventilator and applying whatever best you have at all stages. So from after day two or three, we sort of give them sedation breaks. And instead of continuous sedation, we give them bolus sedations or we give them a spontaneous awakening trial, but then we take them on to sedation again. Paralytics, definitely we transit from continuous infusion to boluses. And then we see... But typically in the first week, uh, other than uh, giving an awakening trial and these patients, before they get up, they again get tachypneic. So immediately we blunt in the respiratory dive, sedate them again, give them a paralytic bolus and keep them like that. So individualize your strategies to the lung. Now many patients who get intubated in the at the end of second week or beginning of third week when their lungs are fibrosed, you know, they just don't, don't get ventilated. It's very difficult. You dial in 350 ml and then, you know, with that, you will be getting high peak, peak pressures of around 40, 45, even when the extra pulmonary compliance is not there. And God forbid, if you have an obese person and you are dialing in even 500, the, you know, the pressures will go around 55, 60. And in India, typically, uh, we don't have uh, ways to, you know, either uh, calculate the extra pulmonary compliance. So here, what we do is the standard teaching is sedate, Paralyze. Don't look at the plateau pressures. You look at the driving pressures, you know, and if you feel that the extra pulmonary compliance is very high, please do your prayers that there is no pneumothorax. Set the peak pressure alarm at around 50 or 55. Just see that he gets his 6 ml per kg. If he cannot get it, come down on the peak first. So here in this place, what we do is we know PEEP is not going to help in the third week unless there is a super infection or some cardiogenic pulmonary edema. So we reduce the PEEP to 6, 5, 4 or even 3 so that we can generate given some tidal volumes, you know, and uh, then we leave them like that. So volume control is good. PEEP should be minimum. FiO2 try to come down to less than 60%. God knows when we will achieve it. Keep them sedated, paralyzed for 72 hours. After that, you know, give them spontaneous awakening trials and go on intermittent paralytics. We wait for the day to give them some spontaneous breathing trials in the form of, you know, from volume control. Typically, they can go to volume assist control or if from assist control, maybe in by day 14 or 15, they may go on to some pressure support trials. But this is how we start ventilating. I mean, if there's anything else you can ask, uh, feel free to ask. Great, Saito. It is very enlightening and informative, definitely, to get the knowledge of your approach. Yeah, and the other thing I want to ask is that if there is a pneumo, you know, uh, and these patients have crazy, they have pneumomedia stenums, then there's a huge debate if you are on a control mode and sedated, whether a ICD will help when there is a pneumomedia stenum. The pulmonology never agrees. The ICU is always ready. But, you know, and so pneumomedia stenum, we are still not sure what to do, but we definitely bring down the PEEP to one or two and tidal volumes to the lowest possible. Uh, but definitely we go in with early ICDs. There are patients who have had bilateral ICDs. So whenever there's a suspicion of pneumothorax, it's not easy to diagnose. We do lung ultrasounds. If we are very clear, there's a pneumothorax. And if there is a problem with ventilation and the carbon dioxide levels are going up or the oxygenation is going down, then definitely we put in our ICDs. Most of the time we land up with bilateral ICDs. We don't have extracorporeal CO2 removal with us. We do have facilities for ECMO, but then ECMO is a, uh, the machines are limited and uh, the teams are also limited and jumbo centers, we can't do it. And uh, with COVID positive patients, no, there are not many takers. And the last thing is we're carrying out a trial of inhaled nitric oxide, but that is an asymptomatic and mildly symptomatic patient to get a ventilator, which is compatible with nitric oxide and to do it in a patient who's, uh, you know, intubated and prone. Uh, well, uh, we've not tried that actually. The evidence also says it's to be used early and definitely even in early users we are finding many patients who get hypotensive with that yeah i've taken a lot of time thanks so okay, sir. so um now i move to mr daniel mr daniel if i if i can ask you um in your part of globe do you have any different approach of, to these these two scenarios like uh one is 
when to switch from you know HFNC to an IV to intubation and and what you guys used to do with refractory hypoxemia even after intubation and prone ventilation. Um, as Dr. Vivek had mentioned, um, it sounds like he and I work at the same hospital. He was very thorough and his approach is exactly our approach. Um, one thing that I want to emphasize um, is uh, the importance of clinical practice guidelines to standardize care. We know that based on best evidence that's emerged over the last decade and uh, or two, um, translating best evidence to the bedside hasn't been so good, even though it can improve patient survival. So one thing that I've done at University of Virginia is developed clinical practice guidelines for providing lung protective ventilation at the onset of mechanical ventilation for patients with or without ARDS. So we're already starting out with six mils per kilogram at the onset of mechanical ventilation. We're also measuring airway driving pressures immediately after we intubate the patient so that we can get a baseline. And then if we have to go up on PEEP uh, to see if we have recruitable lung tissue, you go back and measure that airway driving pressure again. And if it goes down, that indicates uh, uh, fairly confidently that you have recruitable lung tissue. If that airway driving pressure goes up, it indicates that you may be over distended. So at that point, the thing that we would do a bit differently is uh, go ahead and individualize that mechanical breath profile with transpulmonary pressure uh, manometry guided um, ventilation so that even though we're using low tidal volumes, we want to actually set optimal PEEP and we have the ability to do that uh, with a uh, specialized ventilator or with a split screen monitor, either way it works. Um, and also, uh, we heard uh, inhaled nitric oxide. We do use that um, because of the uh, in selective patients, because of the pulmonary vascular resistance being so high with uh, patients who are uh, demonstrating this refractory hypoxemia. So we want to unload the right ventricle. Um, and then we are an ECMO center. And I know that uh, in uh, many countries, they're not as available. Um, so I, I think that um, everything else was very well covered as I was taking notes. Um, with regard to mode, um, I have always told people when I teach my physicians and my respiratory therapy staff, um, it's not really mode, but strategy. Some people are feel, feel more com uh, comfortable with a pressure mode versus a volume mode. So it's really based on strategy. What's your goal? And then by knowing your ventilator, you will be able to apply a strategy that meets that patient's needs. Okay. Great to hear, sir. Now, uh, if I move to Akash, Akash, what is your experience as a RT in, um, in again, the same thing, when you guys do this uh, shifting thing and uh, what you guys suggest or you, if you have an experience regarding these patients of uh, refractory hypoxemia? Akash? Akash, can you hear me? I think Akash cannot. Uh, yes, sir. So, so okay. yeah. Uh, yeah, please. Yes, sir. Is it audible? Yeah, yeah. You're yeah. So now, as I said, that when we when we first uh, initiate uh, the high flow, uh, and we see that the, the patient is in highly respiratory distress, and then we take the uh, call to put the patient on non-invasive ventilation, uh, where we what we what we do is we we try to uh, uh, choose the right interface. So, so, uh, so the interface, what we choose there is the helmet interface. Okay, we have, we, we try to avoid uh, an IV mask in the in the COVID ICU um, uh, because what we have seen is uh, mostly because because of the long term an IV mask fixation, the, the patients have um, patients are patients are too much uncomfortable. They are getting pressure shows and there is a lot of leakage issues from the NIV mask. And what we have observed is when we put a helmet. Uh, uh, interface, uh, we have seen a minimal leakage and if there's a minimal leakage, then we could see that there's a adequate levels of volume delivery and, and we see that the patient's, patient improves well and we do prone the patients on, on helmet interface. Uh, um, after putting the helmet interface, we Now it comes to switching to the ventilation when we see that the patient is uh, extremely still in the, in the respiratory distress 
Okay, and the patient's work of breathing is increased. And uh, uh, this is the time we, we take a, we choose a, with a, a patient and, and ventilation. Fact, there is some issue. And what we start order. with, uh, what we do impedance tomograph. It has the electro impedance. Okay, I think. Hello. Ah, yeah, Kash. We can hear you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, uh, once we choose to invasive uh, ventilation, we also attach EIT machine. EIT stands for electro impedance uh, tomograph. And in that machine, we'll be able to see the lungs images. And once we intubate the patient, we'll be also able to see that what part of the lung is getting ventilated. And uh, along with it, we do, uh, we do choose to. Uh, incorporate uh, 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 nutrivent catheter which which measures the uh, uh, transpulmonary pressure uh, pressures indirectly and with which we are able to know uh, that uh, what levels of transpulmonary pressures we are achieving along with that we also calculate the frc and of course uh, uh, what what rightly said by dr vick so that uh, we see we do look for the driving pressures of course we not uh, will not look for the platelet pressures only so first we try to recruit the patients uh, the, the, through the transpulmonary pressure uh, guided monitoring, and when, and we see that if the patients are recruitable, uh, uh, we, we do not prune, prune them. But after after the efforts, we see that if the patients are not recruitable through the uh, uh, to the uh, uh, transpulmonary pressure guided monitoring, and we see that the that the, that the patient's functional vascular capacity is still low. And, and the PEEP levels are still uh, um, at the at the adequate levels of eight to ten. Then we then we take a call to prune the patients. We do have observed that uh, once we attach the EIT well, since we are able to see the lung distribution, the, the air distributions in the in the lung, so we we'll, we are able to know that what part of the lung is not getting ventilated, and we try to position the patients. If we try to patient, we we try to initially position the patient, say to uh, left lateral. So so say. So say a uh, 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 good lung up and bad lung down. So in that case, what we what we see is uh, uh, once we attach the belt, we see that what part of the uh, lung is not getting ventilated, and we uh, we give the position the we position the patient accordingly, and we and we, we gradually see that that, uh, that the patient's lung uh, that the part of the lung which was not getting ventilated eventually started getting some air distribution. We we also we are also able to see the over distensions of the of the lung areas in that uh, machine through which it helps us that uh, that what levels of uh, the pressures have uh, to be applied and whether the air, whether the air is being distributed very well in the lungs. Um, so when it comes to the recruitment strategies, um, we we initially uh, try to recruit the patients on the pressure control uh, mode through the through the staircase maneuver, and we try to achieve the optimum uh, PEEP. And and then we put them back on the volume control mode to what uh, optimum PEEP we achieve, which is around 10 to 12. We keep the same PEEP and we try to monitor the driving pressures uh, and and the plateau pressures in order to see that we are not causing the lung injuries. And in case if we have, in case if we see that the patient is, the patient will soon land up into pneumothorax or or the patient by mistakenly have landed into pneumothorax, then we then, then reduce the PEEP to to the lowest possible of two or three. Okay. Moreover, we have also kept um, the beep of zero. The patient uh, patient has uh, already developed pneumothorax, uh, and and of course, uh, along with the EIT monitoring, and we we report the entire data of uh, at, at what levels of FiO2, what beep were uh, being delivered, and along with that beep, uh, what was the functional lateral capacity which was measured, and if, if that functional lateral, uh, if that FRC has improved with the with every incremental uh, uh, beep we have uh, we have done for that patient to recruit. So whenever we recruit, we we try to calculate the FRC you know, uh, and see that whether the patient's lung is recruitable. At the end, when we see that the patient's lung is not recruitable, we prone the patient. Then we prone the patients for for nearly 16 hours, and then we again um, uh, supine the patients for the uh, rest eight hours. And when we see that the patient is improving and uh, we, uh, we gradually come uh, down to the FiO2 levels um, and we, we, we also give them sedation um, of, uh, of trials. After when we see that they are giving sedation vacation trial, we, uh, we put them on an APRV mode. We have mostly used APRV mode in the intensive care unit. Um, which works uh, for the spontaneously breathing patient as well. And we can partially sedate or paralyze the patient as well on the APRV mode. So we, 
we in this aprv mode is also uh, one of the advanced mode where we set the uh, p high pressures uh, according to the uh, according to the plateau pressures of the volume control mode and we have also seen that once we switch the uh, mode to aprv we, we see that there's a, there's a gradual improvement in the uh, oxygenation uh, of the patient and it it may happen that we may not have to prone the patients um, so we have seen uh, we have seen many a times that after achieving the after the uh, after looking at the plateau pressures what we said p high pressures in aprv and the, and the patient's SPO2 uh, comes up with, with, the, with the increase in the compliance. And, and, and by accepting some levels of hypercapnia, we have seen that uh, we have even avoided uh, prone positionings for such patients. Um, but mostly, yes, uh, as, uh, uh, as, as we all are doing when the patient's uh, lungs are extremely non reputable we have to prone the patients and then accordingly do the things. Uh, so this was my experience with the... Uh, uh, I am uh, in a very invasive ventilation in the intensive care unit. Great, Akash. I am delighted to hear your experience. It's good. Okay, so uh, let me quickly ask Ms. Surbhi um, regarding the role of physiotherapy in the in the in the high dependency unit and ICUs of uh, COVID nineteen patients. So, what is your experience, Surbhi? First of all, good evening, everyone. I am very grateful to the organizing committee for giving me this opportunity. Hope all are doing well. Welcome to the question. Uh, mainly in ICU, in ICU setup, there are the patients with FNNC, FN, uh, HFNC, NIV, and mechanical ventilator. And they have their separate physiotherapy management. But what's the common management is in these patients, this, these patients present with severe ventilation perfusion mismatch, which could be overcome by prone position in its recommended hours. Other than this, the airway clearance technique are not recommended during the acute phase of the disease. But in my opinion, the risk-benefit ratio should be evaluated on a single cases basis. For example, if the patient is having pre-existing comorbidities like neuromuscular diseases, COPD, spinal cord injury, etc. So the uh, so, physiotherapy management for the patient with uh, high flow nasal cannula are along with the bronchial hygiene technique. There are breathing exercises like breathing control exercises, thoracic expansion exercises, first lip breathing, segmental breathing, incentive spirometer, and diaphragmatic breathing. With this, joint, uh, joint range of motion exercises, active or active assisted, and bed mobility exercises should be given to this patient. Dialysis is not the issue in these patients, then inspiratory muscle strengthening exercise training can be started in early cases of ICU. And if deep breathing is stimulated, cough, or patient is having persistent dry cough, then I would recommend for breathing step ex stacking exercises. That is, take three to four short breaths without, without exhalation, and then hold for three seconds, then slowly exhale. Through this, patient will be able to generate sufficient amount of tidal volume and can control their respiratory rate. Now, patient with the uh, NIV, positioning, breathing, stacking exercise, breathing control, thoracic expansion, assisted segmental breathing exercises are recommended, and most importantly, relaxation exercises that is advisable in these patients because patient is having uh, much distress and anxiety level is too much high. Along with this limb, limb mobility exercises, <coughs> limb mobility exercises like active or active assisted exercises promote bed mobility exercises also like bedside sitting, chair sitting, wheelchair sitting. In my experience, if patient is in the ICU or in the distress condition, short term goal should be more benefit rather than performing the whole exercise session. Even we can alter our goal according to per session and the patient mental status. One or two uh, exercise should be enough in one session so that patient can easily remember and practice it throughout the day. For intubation patient, the physical management should be frequent change in the position, passive or, or uh, assisted joint mobility exercises. The neuromuscular electric, uh, electrical therapy or stimulation should be planned in the conscious patient to stimulate or make the muscle healthier. Along with this technique to facilitate secretions, including assisted or stimulating cuff maneuver, 
chest percussion, vibration, postural drainage, and airway suctioning should be recommended. Uh, should be recommended to prevent further complications. This facilitate the functional independence to the uh, to the patient, and then and after discharge promote the good uh, good amount of quality of life. Thank you. Okay. Um, so we um, one more point. Um, do you feel or experienced any specific uh, physiotherapy maneuver in you know these refractory hypoxia patient, intubated patients, and a, is there something which works more than other? So, to the best of my knowledge, to date, no such physical modalities are formulated to treat the refractory hypoxemia. But we can uh, we can do just vibrator technique and neuromuscular electrical stimulation. Uh, to use in the physical management. Vibration and, and electrical stimulation stimulate the respiratory muscle function. Other than this, other than the modalities, I found the PNF technique, proprioceptive neuromuscular facility technique used up to the some extent. This includes the diaphragmatic stimulation, the scooping technique, interior basal lift of the chest wall, and segmental stimulation, which assists to stimulate the normal mechanism of the chest wall and help to regain the ventilation perfusion ratio now. Great to hear that, Sabine. Great to hear that. So, so I am, um, I'll ask Mr. Shah to take off from here. Yeah, um, that's great to hear from you, Sabine. I was actually going to ask about rehab in my next, uh, uh, I was going to dive, dive, dive to that uh, area. <laughs> and uh, rightly, you briefed about uh, rehab uh, to us. Uh, so I, my, I know that rehab has become like a part of our treatment for COVID-19 patients and it's an ongoing thing and it has something that will be emphasized post-discharge also. And even to patients that are at home quarantine and uh, that needs to be facilitated to them through, uh, at a distance. So it's becoming a, a prime focus for us now around the globe. Um, I wanted to... Uh, ask from the intensivist, Dr. Vivek, at what point do you initiate pulmonary rehab for your patients with COVID-19, uh, especially those who are staying with you in the, in the ICU for a long term, and you know how the progression is going to go, and you know that they would need. What time do you initiate? What time do you bring in a team? Do, you, do we have a team with us in India I mean, at your setting, and how does it work? Can you can so please we, enlighten us? Yeah. So we have a strong physiotherapy team. And our physiotherapists have been involved in the management of COVID-19 patients uh, right from the first wave itself. So at our first center, which was a dedicated COVID center, when the physiotherapy team was uh, sent in, they definitely one part of the team started with the intensive care unit with the conventional physiotherapy and then they modified themselves to whatever Surbhi has said. But the second team went in into the wards and even now we are following the same practice. So let me first cover the wards. So the first answer is when does pulmonary rehab start it starts when you are admitted so there is a team which goes into the ward and which picks out patients with comorbidities or who are at high risk for venous thromboembolism or who are at high risk for atelectasis and who have disorders like you know uh, sleep disordered breathing obstructive sleep apnea or they are uh, uh, smokers or bronchiectasis or damaged lungs due to pulmonary tuberculosis or other comorbidities which make them prone to dvt so these are the patients who undergo routine physiotherapy in the ward itself and here we do they do both the limb uh, physiotherapy as well as the chest physiotherapy most of these patients are mandatorily made to walk and besides the physiotherapy, they also help out with the positioning and proning. But one of the greatest advantages of physiotherapists beyond their routine, active, passive and chest physio is that I think it gives a huge psychological boost to the patient. I mean, this is unmatched. Doctors taking their rounds and going is away. But when the patient is made to sit and walk, 
you know that the the, the amount of satisfaction and the amount of uh, self confidence they regain is phenomenal and on the other side even if the doctor feels the patient is good but the physios make them walk and they desaturate they don't have to do a formal 6 six minute walk test but if they desaturate well we know well this patient needs more support and more aggressive treatment now as far as the intensive care units are concerned again so they address patients both on nrbm on hfnc on niv where they do the routine stuff and just document that whether the patient is able to do out all the activities they were doing yesterday and in case they doc they are one of the first ones actually to pick up progression of disease you know they are the first ones they tell you that today you know this patient got tachypneic today this patient desaturated to 86 yesterday they were you know able to walk a little till uh, with a saturation of 90 but when it comes to the intubated sedated paralyzed patients well uh, the it's uh, full passive limb physio active physio chest physio and of course they use the muscle stimulator uh, to keep them going because most of these covids if they recover they are all quadriparatic and most of them have a critical illness polyneuromyopathy and it is very very difficult so the rehab there is no rehab it starts at admission it continues through and through and we also offer the services of a uh, post covid rehab services which can be virtual when the patient is discharged and then it becomes physical and they come in into the rehab and as per in whichever category they are and they undergo formal again uh, pass, uh, the, basically they are dealt with by a nutritionist a uh, psychologist a uh, physiotherapist and they are made to go through the routine activities then there's some passive and assessments physio assessments in great detail and see whatever best they can do and then they are pushed to the next step so i think uh but there are many centers in the country where physios are not going in by virtue of whatever practices they have but we our physios have been involved and we have definitely noted a change in outcomes and in the icu you know many a times these covid patients they either have a left lower lobe collapse or they have a right lower upper lobe collapse and uh, you know uh, bronch is not so easy to do the pulmonologist may not agree and it is a aerosol generating procedure like in the jumbo facility we have one common negative isolation all 30 beds are there in that you don't have separate negative isolation so uh, our nursing staff is good and as doctors we can put the left lung up or the right lung up but then we tell the physio boss we need two to three sessions here they do whatever magic they have to do but lungs do open up of course we use ancillary therapies which are not evidence based like n acetyl cysteine nebulizations and we try to use inline nebulizers which are not available all the time okay we don't have vibrating mesh we have ordered for one or two it will be coming in so uh, definitely there is a role and i think like we write nutrition prescriptions which akash will understand we also should write the physio prescriptions and you know so that they are very focused and you give them a focused job they will in 3 days your x-ray will look black again okay thank you that's great sir to hear that and uh, it's it's a boost for that uh, for that packet of uh, multidisciplinary for us and uh, i'm sure they do a good job for you to talk so much about it it's it's really uh, overwhelming i hope they're hearing it uh then i would like to bring you at this point to know what actually happens at that part of the world uh where the rehab would be more a bit more structured than we have it in india and uh, i just want to know how your uh, what what actually happens at uh, at you know in your hospital setup and how it is progressed and what are the how is the follow up done and uh, what is the turnover okay um so we're not as structured as we would like to be of course um we're at a point where in an acute care facility we're taking care of the acute patients we're not very good at rehabilitation um I, I think that there is opportunity for all of us to improve, not only with ambulation, but with also getting physical therapy more involved towards the uh, the recovery phase with 
basic bedside range of motion. Um, there's also been uh, some discussion uh, through the panel about uh, functional electrical stimulation. And I think this is a growing area that I'm beginning to see uh, appear in the medical literature where electrodes can be placed on the obliques and then uh, maybe twice a day for 30 minutes, they're doing functional electrical stimulation with surface electrodes. And uh, two pilot studies, one came out of Australia, the other one from Holland, pulled together, uh, I think the N or the sample population was 40. And they indicated that while uh, the diaphragm thickness did not seem to improve uh, in terms of mass, uh, days on mechanical ventilation actually did decrease with functional electrical stimulation. So I think this is an area that we're just beginning to explore uh, within my hospital, and I suspect others may follow suit. Okay, uh, so yes, maybe. And uh, anything about, uh, you know, post-discharge uh, follow-ups? I mean, have you heard of any plans that are being made for them? Though even I understand they are with acute care setting, but do you know what is being followed up for these patients post-COVID? I'm sorry, I don't because I don't work in our outpatient clinics. Um, all we do here is for the survivors who do come back, um, many of them come back with the terribly fibrosed lung. Um, but we don't have a rehabilitation center um, within my medical center, so it's off-site. Okay, so um, yeah, so yeah, we all resource limited, getting resource limited now, and that's something that we should currently, you know, work on and plan on with the with with the government to work on. So I would want to know from Akash, uh, in your center, I mean, you have immense number of these cases. And how do you contribute to the ICU rehab? Because you're more with acute care. And as Dr. Was, uh, Dr. Vivek was mentioning, it's it's more of, you know, he puts it from the, from the patients admitted from the day one. So in your ICU rehab, what, what, what all does do you involve in ICU rehab from, from an RT perspective? And how, how much can you contribute to these patients who are acutely ill? Uh, okay, so uh, initially when the uh, uh, when the COVID started, we initially uh, we initially never had the uh, physiotherapists coming into the intensive care unit. So it were it were indirectly we who were looking the RTs who were looking at uh, the part of rehabilitation. So so when we used to receive the patients on um, in the ICU and we, and when we have stabilized them for say around uh, two days three days we we also used to mobilize them uh, on this chair with the niv mask or with the helmet interface okay and um, and once the fi2 requirement uh, uh, comes down we, we used to put them on a on a nrbm and help them walk and you know mobilize them with the with a the little high flow of the oxygen uh, um, in, in able to maintain a good saturation while walking okay. Then uh, and and during the same time, your diaphragmatic breathing. Uh, then then just with you know, all these things we used to do in the early times uh, when when the COVID started, when we uh, when we were not having uh, fifty drivers coming into the uh, intensive care uh, uh, unit. Uh, in, eventually, when um, uh, when we have the fifty coming into the uh, into the team lately, um, uh, in the in, in this uh, last six months, um, you know, improvement in the, in the part of rehabilitation. Uh, I guess this is a, this is a network issue. Uh, now it's audible. Yes, yes. Yeah. So, uh, so in the last six months, when we have seen that the physiotherapist is coming into the intensive care unit, so uh, uh, we as an R, we uh, as a physiotherapist therapist uh, uh, used to coordinate with them that uh, what all things we have been doing with the patients and you know what all things um, uh, you know uh, a specific patient requires whether it comes to breathing exercises or chest physio so for example if you have if you have a patient who's on a ventilator on invasive ventilation and uh, and whom we have attached an eit belt and and we know that that this particular part of the lung is collapsed so so we we, uh, we supported the physiotherapist we used, to, we used to tell them that we need to uh, we need to give the chest physiotherapy to, to this patient at this particular area of the lung which will help open up the lungs as well, and which we eventually see into that uh, electrical imp impedance tomograph. Moreover, we have also seen that when the patient's FIR2 requirement comes down, and when the when the patient is uh, um, when the patient is given off sedation trial, we we also mobilize them on an invasive ventilation with endotracheal tube. We help them sit on the chair, okay, and uh, we we help them we, uh, we we make them stand on you know at the bedside with the tube in. 
Okay, I know it's risky, but uh, but uh, we think that uh, you know it is also important so that they uh, they gain certain confidence. And we do it at the, at the time when the FI requirements are extremely low, low, and 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 most of the patients are at the edge of uh, extubation. And post uh, post extubation, where uh, where the more focus on the pulmonary rehabilitation uh, comes, which includes the incentive spirometer and the acapella um, and the breathing exercises, uh, which is which we as an RTs along with the therapist uh, do, which is uh, which is going on till and and initially when we receive the patient uh, in the in the intensive care unit when he he or she is not on on a very high support. Uh, then also the same thing applies for the patient where we where we teach them breathing exercises along with the help of his therapist we we help them mobilize um, we help them mobilize at least four to five times a day to uh, to help them get that strength uh, to walk because we have seen that a lot of patient doesn't even have strength to even stand up uh, at the bedside and um, and when we eventually do it for a, for a regular basis okay we see that the strength again you know gaining up and we do it as a at a very safer side that we we increase the FI to levels. So suppose if you, if I want to uh, make the patient stand on the chair, then I will put the patient on a, an RBM and and put a 15 liters of the flow, and I will see the patient maintains 100% of oxygen at that time. Okay, especially when he is standing up. Okay, or walk, or or even if is uh, even is uh, even if he's mobilized on the chair, and then we eventually uh, put that patient uh, uh, back on the uh, bed. Okay, and then slowly, slowly we reduce the FI2, uh, and then come down to the um, FI2, which was which was said already. So this is how we this is how we exactly do the pulmonary rehabilitation part in the intensive care unit. Okay, that's great to hear, and I'm hearing the one voice of being uh, as a team, multi uh, multidisciplinary, and you know at least in some units we are having this teamwork that's really voicing out that's going on really well and the outcome is uh, you know the patient is getting better uh, it's really encouraging and it's really a boost for our topic today to hear on this and uh, because of such importance of pr and being pulmonary rehabilitation and being uh, the importance of going to tele rehabilitation tomorrow in our session we have a talk on the same topic and uh, by one of the one of our uh, uh, RTs who are practicing it, uh, you know, in down south. So um, uh, I think uh, there'll be many years to it on how it's being done from her side. And um, it's great to know that it's happening uh, multidisciplinary at uh, different points. Uh, I would like, uh, I, and we're running short of time, we have exceeded our time limit. I would uh, want to just uh, touch on one more topic before we end for today, which is a very, very important aspect, and that is uh, infection control and how to prevent uh, hospital-acquired infection and protection of our healthcare workers. So I would just want to uh, bring in Vasanta Madam here, and, you know, it is, I just want to know, want, want her to enlighten us on how this is done uh, 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 with such massive load that's coming to the unit, uh, to the hospital, and with limitations of uh, in negative rooms. We don't have negative rooms anymore. Even the most uh, resourced places are not having any more resources and becoming resource limited. So what are we doing for these, uh, you know, this crisis? And how are we segregating uh, patients uh, from, to critical care? And without, in the absence of negative rooms, what are we doing? And are we segregating adult and pediatric populations? Are there I mean, is there, a, is there a concern there and what are we doing in our hospital setup? Can you please just uh, throw some light on that? In fact, yes, you are right. Infection control, which is a very big challenge for these patients. For that, we have to follow first infection control, which comes from the healthcare worker from itself. So first, the foremost infection control practice is wearing the appropriate PPEs, mask, and then other for the healthcare workers because uh, they are the frontline warriors. The infection control has some breach. That is the reason we have lost in all category, the frontline warriors. So that is the first and foremost. And then following the BMWs, how to discard the waste and then we have been kept very appropriately in the hospital side and then we have taught all the category of the employees how to use this BMW and then segregation. Another one more question you have asked, it is the initial part of the infection control. Another one more question you have asked about the 
negative pressure because negative pressure uh, hospital beds rooms are very much needed for these covid patients to overcome these we have that is renovated our wards with the exhaust fans which is very much easy to consider as a negative pressure and then we have been given the very much ventilated wards if it is hd used or wards to these patients to overcome this negative pressure to and then the bed distance we have created 2 meter between one bed to another bed with the appropriate curtains so these are all the very minimal things we have done in point of control of infections in the ward and then we have to see the infection control for the nursing practices or how they are teaching it start from hygiene hygiene of the patient in each parameter we have taken care of the hygiene maybe the skin care the mask the cannulas which they are using the tubings which have been appropriately it has been changed within 72 hours maximum and then taking the swab if it is a et taking the swab and sending into the culture and then identification and then fumigation of the that is uh, infection uh, preventing measures from the rooms we have taken the swab to identify if it is any organism which is growing so these are all the next category what we have been reduce the infection control practices apart from that we have to uh, do the suctioning the aerosol generated procedures we have been kept with the we have made a device which we have been made it like a tent in that we have started doing the tracheostomy et intubation suctioning maximum the close suctioning method which is very much helpful to that is aerosol generating uh, will be reduced and then which will be controlling the infection of these patients and then for the uh, sanitization of the particular area with appropriate timing every two hours it has been maintained and then the all the bed uh, that is a bed uh, bed sheets their quins everything has been with the proper timing which have been reduced for the infections so which was high possibilities of giving infection because the prone position the patient has been kept so the prone position there is a very much chance for the patient to uh, wetting the bed and then other things which has been continuously monitored for these uh, patients uh, if it is icu one is to one ratio of the nurse has been maintained for them to putting it in uh, prone and then keep watching totally the one is to one for infection control the handling of the patient they have been used with the sterile gloves because they have been already having their nitrile glycerin gloves apart from that they have been given with a sterile gloves when they will be touching the patient so and then one patient to another patient movement which has been reduced in uh, reduction of the patient visitors inside the hospital premises it is also a very much because many patients they have come with a infection also they have been mingling with other patient so which has been reduced so if we see the infection control it is not only in the particular inside unit which has been taken care in a part of every unit from the healthcare workers till the end of the patient relatives we have been taken care and then it has been educated to every common public as well as to the last person who is segregating the waste so co collecting the swab and then identifying the timely microorganism and then treating the patient this is what the nurses has been reduce the infection control in our hospital we have been treated mucor patients and then very less with other infections and then which is the outside patients only we have got inside hospital those infections are very limited because of that proper handling of the equipments and then the sterile procedure maximum the sterile technique which has been useful for each and every procedure which is very much helpful to the patient so that we have been maintained uh, in throughout this pandemic first and second so this okay. is what the infection control has been maintained thank you so much ma'am for your inputs and your experience and what is being practiced at aims uh dan would you like to brief uh, quickly on any any particular point that we have to be uh, thoughtful on especially when you have this 
immense usage of our respiratory equipment and uh, you know them shifting from HFNC to NIV and then intubation and then ventilator. So you know anything that you want to give us as a guideline or any 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 kind of tips that you know our delegates can actually kind of uh, focus on than yes. If yeah. One thing is that. Okay. Yes. Um, yeah. Just uh, real quickly, uh, we know that many of the mechanical ventilator platforms that are on the market now um, allow not only invasive but non-invasive ventilation and high flow oxygen administration. So you're taking up a single platform of space in a patient's room rather than bringing lots of equipment into a room. Um, the other thing that we have to be cognizant of, of course, as we're continuing to see waves of COVID um, internationally, is what this means for our supply chain in terms of PPE. Um, one thing that we've done because of limited supply during wave one is um, we have taken the monitors off of the ventilator and we actually have a cable attached to the central ventilator unit uh, attached to the monitor and the monitors outside of the patient's room so that the clinician doesn't have to keep going in and out of the room to make a ventilator mm -hmm. adjustment. Um, so the, I think that's a, a very uh, important very, uh, comment I'd like to comment. Yeah, that's a good point. If you have the facility and the infrastructure for it, it's a great uh, thing that uh, we may be able to adapt in future. Uh, anything that you want to add, Dr. Vivek, on the infection control practices for COVID-19 patients? or in terms of equipments that are being used or for respiratory care specifically? Yeah, so uh, there is definitely an increased incidence of uh, uh, infections, the hospital acquired infections. There's an increased incidence of uh, respiratory infections like uh, ventilator associated pneumonias. Even for patients who are not intubated, there is an increased incidence of hospital acquired pneumonias, probably because they have received one of the immune modulators and steroids and they are immune suppressed. There is also an increase in incidence of central line associated bloodstream infections. And uh, uh, when we started, you know, so we were first happy fi uh, fighting COVID. And then we were happy giving them immune suppressives. But then thereafter until date, we have been uh, not so happy fighting the MDR bugs. So it is presumed that all COVID patients as they go through ER, ward, ICU will get colonized. And subsequently, when they get uh, immune modulator like a tocilizumab, will get immune suppressed. And at some stage, you know, they will have a transition from the lung or the gut flora. There will be a pulmonary or a gastrointestinal transmigration of bacteria or fungi. And they will have either a bloodstream infection or a pulmonary infection or any other organ infection. And it could be a disseminated infection. So... Uh, you need very strict infection control policies. To summarize it, we involved the infection control team. There was a huge role for the infection control nurse. Uh, we monitored the hand hygiene and the compliance to hand hygiene. And this was uh, pre-dawning. Now, once you are donned, it is very difficult to do so. So there was a third pair of gloves which was used in handling patients. The nurses were instructed to change gloves between the handling of a nasogastric tube versus handling of a endotracheal tube versus positioning the patient. While doing procedures, in addition to donning, the doctors and the assisting staff uh, were made to wear the green gowns, the sterile gowns, and full aseptic precautions were taken while uh, putting in a central line or while intubating a patient. Of course, uh, disconnection of the circuits was not practiced, but once in a while when required, it was done. Closed suctioning was implemented and made mandatory. And uh, uh, the closed suctioning was done in a very, very proper manner. In addition to all this, uh, the cleaning of the unit was done with hypochlorite. And I think we used higher concentrations of hypochlorite to up to almost 5% hypochlorite for cleaning the mono, the bed rails and other uh, uh, and ancillary stuff around the patient. And the cleaning frequency was increased from once a day to maybe three times or four times a day. 
then we monitored the uh, antibiograms and the patients many patients grew bugs in the pulmonary secretions like acinetobacter klebsiella or pseudomonas some of them were colonizers some were definitely infectors then we also grew candida auris and then patients had to be cohorted so the candida auris patients were cohorted separately the other gram negatives were cohorted separately then we had to move on to the choice of antimicrobials and we had to stop using carbapenems and go on to a carbapenem uh, sparing strategy we had to strengthen our antibiotic policies stop irrational use of antibiotics in the ward any every covid entering the hospital i think none of them needs antibiotics for mild disease for moderate disease if they are going on to steroids and if they uh, there is a suspicion you can start with a simple thing like a beta lactam and a beta lactam inhibitor but beyond that antibiotics were only used in the intensive care unit and that too under the guidance of a id physician now with all this the rates did come down significantly but then we have to be extremely careful and in the end is i will say wash your hands even when you have gloves so the simple question is how do i do it so after donning use a third pair of gloves while handling the patients and then discard the glove uh, between handling different side of the patients because you can't take out the gloves and wash your hands so that is extremely important and uh, don't touch what is not required touch what is required with every touch you change the gloves and see that the unit cleaning is done meticulously we've achieved huge successes with this strategy that's a lot of lot of work and i'm sure uh, with the way you're saying it's all very systematic now but it's been a big big task for you in the initial period to get to what you're saying now mm -hmm. uh, and uh, i i would uh, uh, like to just uh, I will summarize now on this panel discussion because we have well exceeded the time limit. Uh, so, uh, as the topic was on multidisciplinary respiratory care, I hope we have touched on important aspects dealing with respiratory care of COVID-19 patients, uh, starting from the ER to um, respiratory management and going into the pulmonary rehab that they would require, and also the infection control as, as the background. You know, from the time they are. there in the uh, hospital uh, so any final thoughts from any of the panelists that they want to add in uh, before we wind up uh, anyone wants to speak anything yeah i want to say i think the most important thing which we have learned more than any form of multidisciplinary therapy or any equipment is the presence of human beings you know because when these patients are admitted they are isolated from their families and the, uh, the anxiety is profound so if the patient is seen by the treating team then by a respiratory therapist then by a physiotherapist then by a dietitian i think they you know they they drive away a lot of anxiety and this human presence human touch reassurance is huge otherwise you know with patients with niv and hfnc we find lot of tachypnea and tachycardia and we do the entire work up and we reach nowhere and in the end we just understand that you know he is afraid he will die because the, maybe two of his relatives have already died so i think the human presence nobody can uh, match it it's a i think that's a lesson for all of us today i agree I agree with this thing, and you, you know, uh, with this uh, discussion today, we at least I have learned um, um, more from you guys from uh, you know uh, across the globe. I'm I'm sure all of the all of the attendees also learned today regarding the management of COVID nineteen in different scenarios, including rehabilitation. So thank you very much to all of you, sir. Thank you very much. So. i think you have written a conclude this session here thank you everyone thank you thank you sir thank you thank you all for this opportunity thank you everyone thank you thanks a lot panel moderators and all the panel members thank you um ms amrita Thank you, sir and madam. With this, we have come to the end of the day one program. Let's call it a day. I, Hemlata, on the behalf of AIMS Rishikesh, in association with IERC, thanking you all for the active participation and patience listening. For day two program, I request all the dignitary speakers and participants to join at the same time tomorrow at 4 p.m. Indian Standard Time. 
the link is uh, sent in the chat box so you can click there and register yourself for day 2 program thank you all. thank you thank you all thank you guys thank you thank you